Welcome to the COP26 Nature Newsroom here in Glasgow. Uh, Jakob Hafele, you are the Managing Director for the Zoe Institute, and you've been working on the EU Green Deal, which is a massive agreement uh, put together by the EU Commission and Member States with more than 600 billion euros to boost the economy in Europe. Can you tell us uh, uh, more about this EU Green Deal? Is it really green? Is, going to, is it going to support climate action? And is it also going to support nature and people on the ground? Thanks. Yes, with the European Green Deal, Ursula von der Leyen has put climate change high on the agenda of the European Union. And this is really great because it represents a fundamental paradigm shift. With the Green Deal, the EU now prioritizes climate goals where economic growth and jobs have been prioritized before. And with that, it turns around the idea that we always have to take care of our economies first. It puts the economy back into its proper place because the economy should be there to serve all of us within the boundaries of our climate. However, the devil is in the details. And while the 55% carbon emissions reduction target the EU has set for 2030 is already quite ambitious compared to where we are now, there is still room for improvement when it comes to achieving the 1.5 degree target. Also, the EU and its member states still focus very much on market-based solutions to the climate crisis. By putting a price on carbon emissions and gradually increasing that price, emissions should be reduced. And while that mechanism itself might be part of the solution, the transition also needs to be just, and that requires further investments and regulations. So we've heard that um scaling up nature-based solutions could help us to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emission and reach 30% of what needs to be done for the Paris Agreement. But then if we look at the EU Green Deal, we work together with you, with Vivid Economics, with many experts, and the end of the, of the study was that uh, the result was that only 1% of the funding is actually going to nature. Why is it so low and what can we do to increase this 1%? I have no idea why it's so low. <laughs> I can't really answer that, I'm afraid. Any recommendations to the EU Commission on why this should change? I think we have to, we have to realize that we are not only facing a climate crisis, but we are also facing a biodiversity loss crisis here. And while we are already doing some huge steps towards you know, mitigating the climate crisis, we are still lacking a lot of what we could do in terms of the biodiversity crisis. And we have to take this seriously, you know, because if there are no bees anymore to pollinate our plants, we are going to be in serious trouble with our food production. Very good point. So we have a twin crisis on climate and biodiversity, and we need to address these two crises together. And you were also talking about going beyond GDP growth. Um, what does it mean in practice for governments, but also for people in their day-to-day -day life going beyond GDP growth? That means that other goals than GDP will be prioritized. And this means that we need to take the interlinkages between those other goals much more seriously. So if you tackle the climate crisis, for instance, by increasing prices, that might mean that fuel might be more expensive. And for suburban workers, this could become a huge burden because if they are already struggling right now, if they have to pay more for their commutes to work, this is a huge burden for them. And to tackle that, to tackle that effectively and to really go beyond GDP, it means we have to look at those interlinked dimensions at the same time and tackle both at the same time. And that requires huge investments into social infrastructure, into public transport mm -hmm. and so on. Do you think we could have a well-being budget here in Europe the way we had it in New Zealand with Jacinda Ardern? I think a well-being budget is a very, very interesting idea and I think the potential of implementing well-being budgets is quite huge. Also, based on our work with the Commission, the Council and the European Parliament, I can say that there is huge interest in the well-being economy and growing interest in the well-being economy right now. Thank you, Jakob. One last word. What is your top message to the leaders who are here in Glasgow in these last couple of days on the climate negotiations? What do you want to tell them? 
To tackle the climate crisis effectively, we need leaders that actually lead the way, brave leaders that dare to go ahead despite the risks that may be involved, leaders that focus on the opportunities, that believe in a future where people and ecosystems thrive. You know, leading the transition doesn't mean waiting for others, waiting for agreements to go together. You know, if Gandhi, Mandela or Rosa Parks would have waited until everyone agrees with their position, they wouldn't have led their respective transformations. So true leaders believe in the change they can make happen, believe in the inspiration they can spark in others, and they dare to go ahead. Thank you, Jakob. Thank you.